Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, another segment for, uh, for My New Lungs and uh, the HRN program itself, where we provide pulmonary and cardiac rehabilitation. I'm your host, Alex Gritschewin. Um, just in case for those that don't know me, I'm, I'm Alex Gritschewin. I'm the, uh, uh, one of the Maryland Board of Physicians as a respiratory care practitioner, a pulmonary care practitioner, specialized in uh, pulmonary rehabilitation specifically. Um, today we're going to be doing some balance exercises, and our main topic today, excuse me, <coughs> main topic is RSV, or the respiratory cylindrical virus, uh, and we're going to be answering some questions and concerns about uh, as there's a new drug, uh, RxV, which I am not pro with because this just came out. It's a brand new drug that uh, helps uh, with reduction in. Uh, RS, uh, RSV symptoms. So let's go ahead and dive right in. If you have any comments or questions, or if you haven't followed us already, please follow us on YouTube, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And we will, um, and we'll just, uh, yeah, every Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, we, we do our live feeds. So uh, you'll be updated with any new uh, new topics. Also, in regards to topics. If you have any topics that you would like us to address, uh, you can bring up, you know, you would like to learn a little bit more about, uh, you know, in this case, RSV. Uh, if you want to learn something about COPD or interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis or heart diseases, anything like that, we're very vast with our education and we're very professional, of course, because this is what we do day in, day out in everyday life. So it's always best to ask uh, the people that kind of work with those types of people that have these types of complications and diseases. Uh, but again, if you have any, uh, if you have any questions or uh, concerns, anything, please write in the comment section, and I'll be happy to address that as we go along. Uh, first thing is we're going to do a little bit of what we call balance training. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stand up. Now, with balance training, I'm going to use a chair. Okay. There's a couple things to understand with balance training is if you don't feel comfortable doing something, usually if somebody has balance issues, uh, somebody to there to assist and help out that person would be helpful because the chances of a person falling because of balance issues, depending on the severity of uh, their balance uh, problems, it could be vertigo, it could be you know maybe muscle weakness, uh, it could be oh, you know different types of, uh, of complications, but. Um, if you don't feel comfortable doing any of these, please consult with your doctor or physician uh, or healthcare provider before doing any of the exercises or techniques. Now, what I'm going to be going over is just basic standard balance training. That's it. Standard balance training. So I'm going to use a chair. The only reason why I'm using a chair, and I could use two chairs, uh, the only reason why I use a chair is just in case if I do have balance, you know, this can help support me. But I, want, I don't want to try to put all my weight on a chair. If I try to put my weight on the chair, it might slip out underneath of me. And I especially don't want to use a chair that has wheels or something that is unsafe. You want to make sure you have proper clothing and proper shoes, especially shoes that kind of stick to the ground a little bit. Okay, sneakers work the best. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to stand right behind my chair. I'm going to lift one leg up, okay, then I'm going to let go. I'm going to hold that position for as long as I can. If I feel that I cannot, I just hold on to the chair and just keep repeating. And I'll repeat with the other leg. This is the very first part of balance training, is maintaining a balance. And this is something that you can do with the comfort of your own home. Then I'll switch to the other side, lifting one leg. This seems very benign, uh, like very petty, but this is kind of a balance exercise that we do with our patients that, do, that does help them quite a bit especially overcome balance issues. The other important part when it comes to balance exercise is make sure you are breathing and not holding your breath. If you're breathing very shallow, you're not bringing in enough oxygen to your body, you're not getting rid of enough CO2, well, your brain has to work and function properly. So if you're not giving the right amount to your brain, your brain might act not the right way. <laughs> so just make sure you're breathing throughout the whole exercise. After I start getting used to that, 
and balance doesn't seem too big of an issue, then I'll move on to another balance exercise. And that is just something as simple as what we call slow walking. Is where I lift one leg up, bring it out, and of course if you had two handrails that would be very helpful. Bring one leg up, out, down, and then I'll bring it and slide right back. And I'll transition to the other leg too. Up, woo. Bring it up, out, down, and then slide back. Then I transition to the right leg again. Out, down, and then slide back. Main point on this is make sure you're moving slowly. You don't want to move fast. You want to move very, very slow. Of course, you could have a chair on either side as you're doing this, just for some support. Down, back, slide back. Up, out, down, and slide back. Then I'm going to walk slowly from one side to the other. Okay, but when I walk slow, make sure you are walking slow. Don't try to just rush it through. Nice, just nice and easy. Don't have to, this is not a sprint. Just go nice and slow. So come up, out, down, up, out, down, up, out, down. And I'll repeat that as I go along. Up, out, down, up, out, down, up, out, down, okay? And you just keep repeating this. Uh, doing this for about 15, 20 minutes a day, when you first wake up in the morning, it's actually pretty darn decent. Especially, you want to make sure that you eat plenty of uh, good food. Make sure that you ha you're hydrated. Uh, that if you're wearing supplemental oxygen, make sure you're wearing your supplemental oxygen during the exercise, just because it's going to help you a little bit, especially with balance. Okay, so balance exercises it does take a little bit of time. Okay, because this is more of a mental problem than a physical problem. Sometimes, sometimes it could be related to a physical problem, but most likely it's more of a mental problem. Not necessarily mental that I can kind of control myself in a, in a way. It's something that, you know, just like any other muscle in my body, my brain is kind of like a muscle. And I want to work that out as much as possible. So walking slowly, doing what we call like a, a fake sobriety test in a sense, uh, will actually be nothing but actually beneficial to you, especially for balance. Okay? I know it seems pretty generic, but nothing has to be the most complicated of exercises for it to work. So we're going to go ahead and jump right into RSV. Let me just give some context as to what it is first. Oh, of course. So I'm going to go over the, uh, the basic definition on what an RSV. So we're talking about the respiratory cylindrical virus, which or RSV. Uh, cause an illness that is usually similar to a moderate to severe cold and is very contagious. RSV most often re uh, resolves on its own about 10 to 14 days and does not cause major health concerns but can become a problem when it is severe or leads to other complications. Premature babies and patients with immune problems or heart and lung problems may be at risk. It is highly contagious, spreading via secretion, saliva, or mucus. Uh, when the patient coughs, sneezes, or talks. Uh, two main types of RSV exist, uh, and patients cannot develop, uh, I'm going to repeat that, patients cannot develop fuel, full immunity to the virus. The infection affects the nose, throat, and upper respiratory system, often exhibit, exhibiting uh, symptoms similar to pneumonia, croup, and uh, laryngeal tracheal bronchitis, uh, or bronchiolitis. Uh, symptoms include mild, uh, mild sore throat, coffee, 
I mean, cough, stuffy, or runny nose, earache, and fever, possibly difficulty breathing as well. Although no treatments for, uh, for SV is available, secondary bacterial infections may be treated with antibiotics and fluids will uh, prevent dehydration. Uh, so there was a new drug, and I'm going to go over this a little bit. This, this came out last week, May the 6th. I believe was last week. Yes, uh, so, that's so, when. Yeah, they come up with these drugs. Uh, they have to go through a lot of testing before a drug can actually be approved through the FDA. So just for a drug to get approved through the FDA, they have to go through vigorous process. You know, a very strong, vigorous process to make sure they're safe and effective, and it went through plenty of peer review for it to be determined as effective. The FDA actually released an article about this uh, to show what they went through. Uh, if you want me to read that. Yeah, go ahead. So, um, let me turn myself down a little bit. Um, for older adults, uh, in particular, those with underlying health conditions such as heart or lung disease uh, that are at higher risk, um, they uh, tested, and in in the study, approximately twelve thousand five hundred participants uh, that received a RexV and twelve thousand five hundred participants. Uh, received a placebo among the participants who received a RexV and the participants who received a placebo, the vaccine significantly reduced uh, the risk of developing RSV associated LRTD. I don't, I'm not sure what LRTD is. Um, it doesn't give context for that. Um, by 82.6% uh, and reduced the risk of developing RSV associated LRTD by 94.1%. Okay, so the vaccine is said to protect older adults against respiratory uh, against the respiratory virus RSV. Uh, now, the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, must decide if every senior really needs RSV protection, or only those considered at a high risk from RSV. So, the people that are usually at a high risk are anybody who is immunocompromised. Okay, so let's talk about immunocompromised really quick. The, if somebody has a cold, are they immunocompromised? Yes. Uh, if they have a fever, they're immunocompromised. Yes. Uh, if they have a, let's say they have a double O lung pneumonia or single lung pneumonia. Yes, of course. If they're sick, yes, they are immunocompromised. If they have a lung or heart disease that has literally been, uh, that's, that's uh, specifically been diagnosed, and of course that person does uh, or does, is, is immunocompromised. Immunocompromisation is where the body can't fight or has a hard time fighting other illnesses when it's trying to fight a certain battle currently inside the body. That's when you're immunocompromised. When all your cells are trying to attack that one thing and then something else is introduced, could actually cause and exacerbate the problem uh, quite significantly. So um, a lot of people are the, who are, especially people in our ages 55 and up, uh, are you know prone to this, especially younger children as well. So we can look at the whole range of people as as from people's just born to all the way up to um, uh, to geriatrics. So uh, RSV, like uh, it, it, it's transmitted through mucus, uh, sneezing, it can even be transmitted through uh, by just talking, coughing, talking, sneezing. Usually it happens in the uh, nasal you know, nasal passages, kind of uh, around where your superior and middle, middle and inferior concha, that's the terminus inside your nose, uh, just right in the septum. So uh, anybody who kind of comes within close contact with, or proximity of a person that is showing signs of sickness uh, should be staying away for a, at least uh, six feet. Uh, usually it's three feet, but we like the six feet rule better actually because you're further away if you have to be in, plo uh, in close proximity with somebody with and you're not sure what they have and you don't want to make that person feel embarrassed but if you're not sure and they say about 60 percent of the people that go to pharmacies are sick you know so anytime you're going to a pharmacy you're going to a public area that has a lot of people around it best thing to do carry a mask just keep a mask with you Keep a simple isolation, you know, uh, wash hands when necessary. Uh, and if you can't go to a sink, then use simple, you know, hand, hand sanitizers, anything like that will work until you get to a sink. Okay. 
Uh, now, when washing your hands, uh, this a lot of people understand how to wash their hands, but some people do it the wrong way. Uh, when washing your hands, you want to make sure that you're at, let's say you're at a sink. Do you turn on the hot water or the cold? It, both, right? You want the water to be warm to hot. Uh, now, let's say you have antibacterial versus regular soap. Which one's better? They both will do the same job. Okay? Antibacterial is not better than regular soap. I'm sorry, but it's not. Okay? So they work the, uh, the same way. They're, the purpose of soap is to decrease surface tension. And uh, it's like taking a droplet of water and putting onto a leaf, and you have the whole entire, you see the whole droplet of water. If you mix in soap with that, the, uh, the water droplet won't look like a droplet of water. It will actually be very lower down. It just decreases the surface tension. Uh, and well, my point on that is, let's say you're washing a, a pan or a pot, and it was greasy, greasy pan or pot, and you're um, using cold water, okay, all it's going to do is just move the grease around. You have oil base on your hands. You have simple, you have normal secretions of oil on your hands, natural oils. So if you have something that's on your hands or potentially could be a contaminated you know, area and you accidentally touch that area. How to wash your hands is very important. Of course, we turn on the hot and cold, right? You take some soap, you do, we can do a Turkish twist. Does anybody remember what a Turkish twist is? It's where you cup your hands and you're washing underneath the sink, getting your nail beds at the same time. You wash for more than 20 seconds, less than two minutes. Make sure you take off any rings or watches. Wash around the wrist. Don't forget the nail beds. You wash for more than 20 seconds, less than two minutes. You can also do your ABCs. And then, of course, you dry them off. Uh, as you dry them, uh, anyways, as we wash hands, just make sure that uh, you're not turning up the temperatures too high. Uh, and washing over, the, uh, over two minutes is kind of redundant. You don't need to wash over two minutes. A lot of people, well, I had one person said they'll, they'll come close to boiling their hands. Don't ever do something that silly. You don't ever want to try to like, get to a temperature that's very, very... That's counterproductive. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're not, you're, it's not just you'll kill your skin, but you also kill the normal floor that's on your hand. That's actually providing some protection. Well, you've uh, also said this before. You do need some natural bacteria. As yeah, well. that's a normal flora that's on your hands. Oh, I apologize. Yeah, no, 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 you're fine. Uh, the normal flora on your hands, you have staff. So you have like staphylococcus, and that's, that produces a, uh, that can be uh, produced to cause a uh, staph infection. Uh, it's a phospholipid that surrounds the cell. Okay, if I had a, um, uh, um, uh, if I had an anatomy chart with a microbe like that, I could easily show you. But uh, there's a phospholipid, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a glycoprotein that surrounds the cell. It's only impermeable to certain antibiotics. So only certain things like penicillin can actually transport, can actually break through that barrier and kill that cell. Uh, but anyways, uh, you have normal flora on your hands, but it doesn't mean, and on your normal flora, what I mean by flora is you have normal bacteria that stays dormant on your hands. That's called flora, F-L-O-R-A. So the flora on your hands, you have staph on there, and you have different types of other things on there, and their job is to protect you. Okay, if we wash them off, then we're also what? You know, compromised, yes. Uh, the other thing is they, uh, they found out that people that use um, heavy mouthwashes that have really, really, really high alcohol content that kills 99.9% .9 of all germs, it doesn't also include the bad germs, but it also includes the good germs too. And people that brush their teeth and use like mouthwashes that have very high alcohol content that kills 99.9% also can be immunocompromised as well after the use of brushing your teeth. Sounds silly, but that is actually a fact. Uh, they're making the other mouthwashes and things like that that, um, that are more, that are still will do the same job, but uh, it kind of helps with normal flora in your mouth even though it's kind of impossible try to separate the good from the bad since they're all bacteria anyways. So Alex, uh, yeah. to go back to RSV just to get on topic, um, in terms of the um, uh, and what RSV is. Um, it's a virus. Correct. That's what I was uh, hoping to uh, 
c confirm this is different from COPD where it isn't chronic. This is something that you can... No, COPD is not a virus. COPD is a, uh, basically it's an abnormality inside the lungs. Uh, different types of COPD, so five types of COPD. So you have emphysema, cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, uh, you have asthma, uh, you have emphysema. Uh, you have five types all together, and they're not necessarily caused by a virus. Uh, now, even if somebody did have a virus, doesn't mean they can get COPD from that virus. So uh, COPD is, ba like, let's take emphysema. Uh, so you have the destruction of the alveoli. And if you have the destruction of the alveoli, so you have an alveoli, alveolar sac, let's say, it looks like a big grape sac. And the little alveolar walls will be destroyed by uh, the trypsin secreted by the uh, phagocytotic cells or the white blood cells that stay dormant inside there. Well, when something comes in, the, the cell, the, the white blood cell secretes trypsin, and that's an acid. Well, we rely on the alpha ones down in the base to neutralize the acid so it doesn't eat away from the membranes. Uh, in emphysema, basically the secretion of the trypsin is over enhanced because of overreaction inside the body. So as it secretes too much, the alpha ones that are supposed to neutralize the base, you understand how that works, you have you have one, let's say, uh, let's use it in a military sense. You have a gunner. You have somebody who mandates the gun. In this case, it's this, uh, it's this uh, white blood cell that's, uh, that shoots out trypsin. Then you have somebody down below that takes the trypsin because it knows if it keeps the trypsin inside that cell, it's just going to eat away from the wall because trypsin is an acid. So uh, the, the alpha ones, what they're supposed to do is neutralize it with a base. Okay, so they secrete a base. Like if you take acid and take uh, baking soda, okay, and put it in there, it'll neutralize the acid so it's not the pH isn't so low, it becomes up, comes up higher, you know, and that's what its job is. But if the, if the white blood cells secrete too much trypsin, the alpha ones can't keep up, and they get eaten away by the acid as well. Well, in in long term sense, that kills out the alveolar wall, and the alveolar wall gets a little more fibrotic. Uh, but that, like I said, that has nothing to do with the virus at all. That's not how viruses work. Mm -hmm. That's just how that's that's an injury in a sense. It's a long term injury, but it's an it's an injury in a sense. The body's reacting the right way. It finds a pollutant. It doesn't like it. It tries to kill it but it, it does more harm than good. And uh, a virus, well, what's the difference on a virus versus a bacteria? Does anybody know? So let's put a virus onto, let's say, this piece of paper. I squirt a virus onto the surface of this paper, OK? How long can that virus live by itself? A couple days, three days, four days the most sometimes. Depends. Okay, lifespan uh, of a virus because a virus it needs a host to live. They can't breathe on its own. They can't eat on its own. They they need you. So if uh, so, when a when when a virus finds a host, it reacts like you are its home. You are its other side, in a sense. And I went through a lot of microbiology classes in college, and because uh, we had to 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 graduate. Um, the one thing I found that, <clears throat> like a virus, they don't want you to die, because if it die, if you die, it dies. It doesn't want you to die. Okay, so virus will try to find a way to live with you. Some people have a virus the rest of their life and they don't even realize it. They're completely asymptomatic. Bacteria, different. They're I would say very selfish. They don't care if you die. They they absolutely do not care if you die. Uh, their job is to consume as much as possible to keep its colony alive. Now, let's say I squirt a bacteria onto a surface. Okay? How long can that bacteria live? Mind you, I'm not specifically stating which bacteria, but how long can that bacteria live by itself onto a surface? A couple days. A couple of days? Try 10 years. Oh. Yep. Now, think about that for a second. So why do, can a bacteria live so much longer than a virus? Because a virus needs a host. Bacteria does not. It just needs to find something to eat, just like any other animal. Okay? But when a, virus, when a bacteria consumes, 
it consumes everything it possibly can. And then it can breathe on its own. It has cytoplasma, mitochondria, which is uh, 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 adrenaline triphosphates that produces energy for the uh, for the cell. You have the cytoplasma, the mitochondria. You have the the uh, 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 you have the uh, the cell wall itself, uh, endoplasmic reticulum. You have everything. It can breathe. It can eat. It can think. It can do replicate. It, sometimes they even have a flagella that can mobilize it and get it from one point to another. You know, from one area to another. So uh, viruses, bacteria work a little di uh, very differently, but a, a, a virus doesn't like, you know, it, 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 once it has a host, it wants to stick with that host if it's a good host. But there are times when the virus dies, the body dies too. And that, that will happen too, of course. Okay. So uh, to look more into this, you know, kind of look on the CDC, but just simply type on like on Google or something and bio viruses versus bacteria. Now the uh, 10 years, that is 100% fact, of course. There are, there are bacteria that can live 10 years by itself without nothing ever coming harm to it. But you have to understand, from every single germ, viruses, bacteria, mold, fungi, whatever, from every single germ ever known, what is the percentage, and this is off the CDC, what is the percentage that is harmful? What do you think, John? 1%. Mm hmm? 1%, right? From every single germ ever known to man. I know it's a very... Ever known to man, so... I know it's a low percentage because we, we have good germs as well. There, there are good ones as well. John, you're not supposed to give away the answer like that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, well, you asked me. I wanted to show that I, that I do pay attention to this. <laughs> So I have been learning it's less something. Than, it's less than 1% that is harmful. A lot of people think it's 30%, it's 40%, it's 50%. No, it's actually less than 1% uh, that is actually harmful. If you take every single germ ever known, less than 1% is actually is, is harmful. So if you've ever gotten sick a day in your life, look at it like this. If you've ever gotten sick a day in your life, ever, you got affected by the less than 1%. Okay. All the other ones are not as harmful as you think. We live in a world of germs, you know? The, imagine taking a child and you're trying to be this overly aggressive uh, parent, let's say, and you put that child into a bubble and that child doesn't go toward, you know, doesn't get exposed to any types of germs ever, okay? This child never gets sick, ever. And this child, let's say, grew up to about, let's say, 15, 16 years old. You release that child from the bubble, and that child will probably live in the atmosphere for maybe about a week until it die, until he or she will die. Because why? No immune system. Nothing. So when we look at, I've often wondered if that's why, like, uh, you have like the older generation. It it seems like they never got sick. You always hear like, oh, I played the outside older generation all the time. never got sick. There's a big reason behind that. Playing outside all the time. Yes. We were outside, we were uh, wrestling in the, the mud and the swamps. And eating dirt. Eating you know? dirt and saying it was healthy and stuff like that. Rub some dirt on it, it'll, yeah, it'll work. It's literally, we, you know, we're just, uh, you throw us a, a anything, it, it literally will just, you know, we're, we're just, it feels like it's un, we're impenetrable. It feels like kids are getting a lot more sick nowadays. Because they're staying inside, they're going inside, they're staying inside, they're playing on their video games and things like that, which is fine, but... Um, if you don't have your, you know, if you don't have a kid that goes outside and kind of, you know, gets scraped up once in a while, you know, I hate to say that, but if you don't let them live, you're talking about. A lot, I mean, have you ever shaken, shook a hand of a 15 year old nowadays? Like some of them are so jelly. <laughs> I'm serious. Well, that's good. That that's that's the grip yeah. in general. <laughs> Not much of a grip. <laughs> it's just jelly, you know. When I was growing up, like all my friends, they didn't have like really soft hands. They like we we were like rock climbing. We were, you Gotta know, get those calluses just, built. Yeah, up. just the calluses on everything. You know, just calluses on our head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just everything was just oh, crazy. Uh, but um, yeah, nowadays you'll find a lot of uh, children having a lot more health complications because of, you know, it, it, it could be due to a lot of the things. It could be due to genetics, of course, but a lot of times it's because that kid's not going outside as much. 
You know, they're they're not going out. They're not being exposed to things. Uh, and I understand that you're trying to keep your child safe, but you're also understanding that their immune system will be a little compromised because it's not being exposed and understanding well, how to fight against pollen, how to fight against this, how to how to you know things like that. Okay. Pamela says she she remembers cloth towels in public restrooms. Do you remember that? I do. I do remember cloth, uh, but uh, Pamela, I remember the ones that you went into the bathroom and they were just reusable and you rolled them and you rolled them. Uh, man, I, I don't remember when, see I'm 45 years old, my birthday was yesterday, but I'm 45 years old and I, I still remember when they used uh, uh, cloth towels, but um, at hotels that's that, pretty common, but you don't reuse the same one. That seems really foreign like to to me like it feels like it, that just doesn't register because it doesn't Pam, register Pam, well pamela's right it's gross like when you think about it how it, many times have i gotten sick in in a year once i mean yeah i mean it, it just proves it but you think about it and it's gross you know? yeah oh yeah yeah i mean yeah <laughs> you, you got those people who one don't wash their hands properly well they, they have then, well they, you know a lot of people try to boost their immune system by taking some uh, some herbal, you know, supplements. Uh, in in this case, uh, I remember that thing with the natural black licorice root. Uh, huge amount of pro, uh, uh, potassium amount, of, just a lot of potassium in it. But uh, people were taking it, and they just couldn't pop. They could. They felt like they couldn't get sick. They just. Uh, it was like nearly impossible to get sick. But as soon as they put it in their mouth and they left it in there for a long time, their body kind of got used to it. Uh, people are having heart attacks because the amount of uh, potassium inside of it. You know, we, we have to understand as, as a society that anything, any medications are not derived from thin air. They're made out from concentrated materials, you know, in this case, plants and, and bacterias and, and uh, soils and things like that that makes these medications. So it's not uncommon to find, you know, something out there like a root in this case natural black licorice root that has high potassium amounts that can actually cause you do you more harm than good and we also have to understand the vitamins a lot of people take a lot of vitamin C which is great uh, but there are th there are um, uh, vitamins A D E and K all right too much of them vitamins A vitamin D vitamin E and vitamin K too much of those can actually cause an adverse effect. That's why anytime we take anything, we eat something, we always want to make sure we, uh, I don't want to say dilute it, but you won't always want to make sure you hydrate plenty, especially if it's you know something that had a lot of salt and you accidentally ate it. You, know, you want to make sure that you have a good amount of fluid inside of you to kind of help manage that heightening of salt or whatever ingredient in, in there. Too much of a good thing. Yes, Basically. absolutely, absolutely. Uh, everyone is saying happy birthday to you, by the way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michelle, Beth, Deb, Mary, Pamela, Rebecca, everybody. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, 45 years old. You've been saying you're 45 for like seven months now. So. I, I've been doing that. You know why? Because it, it prepares me when I say I'm 45. <laughs> you know, I kind of get used to that. I, do, I don't know why I do that. I do that a lot. I mean, you know, hey. if I'm not 40, like if I'm, to, <laughs> I was 44, I was telling everyone I was 45 because I, I, I wanted to get used to that I'm 45 years old. I still get carded, you know. Well, that's a good thing then, isn't it? Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> you know, good exercise, eating right, you know, do, uh, being prophylactic, being uh, preventative, you know. See, uh, at my age, being carded is, a, uh, is an annoyance. <laughs> at your age, it's a compliment. <laughs> Yeah, somebody said, you're not 45. <laughs> when I went to the DMV guy to get the, my license renewed, and they're like, what? And he says, this shows that you were born in 78. And I said, yeah. And they're like, so you don't look like you're four in your 40s at all. I said, well, thank you very much. I said, how old do I look? You know? And usually it's, th you know, t it's uh, like lo lower 30s, but. <laughs> as, long, as long as I don't say uh, like 68 or something like that when, when you look. <laughs> When you look for, when you are forty five, right? As long as they don't age you. It's not the age I feel. It's the mileage. It's not the age of the vehicle. It's the mileage. A lot of us we've we've walked. You're a <laughs> Diana says you're a spring chicken. 
I mean, it's hard to argue. Yeah, I mean, but it's it's not the age of the vehicle; it's the mileage. It's just how much you put into uh, yourself that you know. It's all that wear and tear, you know. But um, no, I'm still young. I'm very young. Forty-five. Trust me, I'm young. Okay. So, just to ask one more question uh, about uh, uh, RSV before we move on to our next topic here. Sure. Uh, if anybody has any questions about RSV or anything that we're going to talk about today, feel free to put them in the comment section. But uh, is there a difference between uh, RSV in, in, in infants, young children, and adults? So this, so this vaccine um, also is for individuals 60 and above is what it's released for right now. Uh, and that's scheduled to come out as early as the late summer this year. So, um, Diane Pierce, that answers your question, when will this drug be available? It's a great question, but it looks like it'll be available this summer. Yeah, as early as this summer. I've seen, it's saying this summer, it's also saying uh, before uh, the winter of 2023 and 2024, so, I, so that would be like December to February, something like that. So, it really, it's just that window, really. Um, but and remember, everybody, this is a brand new, brand new drug that just came out literally last week. Yeah, it was, it was, it was uh, like they did. They finished testing last week. So now it does say people who receive the vaccine significantly reduce the risk of developing RSV associated lower respiratory tract disease or LRTD by 82 percent. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not perfect. So. Yeah, no, 82%. That's a huge reduction. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a huge reduction, but it's not 100%. You know? Well, so scientists what, don't like, ever use 100%. If, uh, like, uh, this is a common misconception. Uh, I'll, I'll bring up a common misconception. Um, a lot of people feel that, all right, let me, let me try this albuterol. Let me try this medication. Everyone's feeling like the relief rate, and when I talk about relief rate, I'm talking about the alleviation of symptoms. So <clears throat> what percentage? Okay. Uh, people feel that they want their medication. And I don't blame them. They, they feel that they want the medications to give them at least a, a 90 to a, a nearly almost 100% relief value, which is not going to be available. Okay. If you're looking at something with the highest relief value, you're looking at something with the highest side effects. I guarantee it. You know, long list of side effects. Or it's Let's not take, real. Hmm? Or well, it's yeah, not because, real. I mean, you're, you're talking about something with a very high relief value. It's, uh, it's you know, people go through microbiology. They, they, you know, they become a scientist to go into the science and they learn the physiology, the natures, the, you know, the, everything uh, in, in regards to, uh, uh, micro, uh, you know, uh, uh, microbes and, 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 you know, RSV and any type of disease. Uh, but like when we're looking at vaccines and curing, so it's it's a science in its in its own. I was in microbiology for quite some time, and I was very interested in microbiology quite a bit. Uh, but it was very it's it's very informative, but it, it's it's very scientific. There's a lot of calculations, a lot of things you do, a lot of tests and procedures, and um, a lot of trial and errors. You know. But when you're looking at something with the highest side effects, you know, and you're looking at something with the highest relief value, let's take prednisone, for instance, okay? People don't like prednisone because, the, because so many side effects, but the relief value is like above 80%. But you're looking at a side effects a mile long. Mm -hmm. Take albuterol, what's the relief value off of albuterol? 12%. If you're going to leave you by 12% or more, it's, a, it's considered an effective drug. It's not meant to relieve you 100%. There is no drug in existence that can relieve you by 100%. It's like 99.9%. We, we never use 100%. Okay? Because in science, you always look at the potential of that one person potentially having a, one complication. You're, you're always looking at that as a possibility. Okay? You'll never... If you see a drug that says gives you 100% relief value, most likely it's not going to be, uh, unless it's something... Odds are the FDA didn't approve it. 
Uh, yeah, the chances are FDA wouldn't uh, wouldn't approve of it because they want to see 100%. So you went through 7.6 billion people and you tested amongst all these people and stuff like that. I don't even know how it all works out. On I know my wife would know very very well because that's that's what she does for a living. She she gets drugs approved through the FDA. She's a senior uh, level and she's uh, smart as a whip. Whew, she is smart. Um, I mean, she has a master's degree in, in microbiology. She's just incredibly smart. But um, when she talks to me about, you know, about FDA approval and things like that, she doesn't talk to me about, you know, her company and what they're approving and stuff. They just, just like, you know, how to get some things submitted through the FDA. When she talks about things like that, it just puts me right to sleep. Because so. uh, <laughs> it's just, it's very hard to understand everything that she has to do. You know, and it's very tedious. It's, but anyways, when you're looking at a, a medication, you never, you don't ever expect 100% relief value. If it relieved you a little bit, then it worked. That's the rule of thumb. Okay, uh, there shouldn't be a medication that relieves you by 100%. But when you're looking at something with a very high relief value, expect a lot of side effects. Is my point. So it that's actually interesting because that's it, that reminds me of what people what they say about like the COVID vaccine is that it you can still get COVID from it or yeah. not from it but you can still get COVID after you've gotten it sure. yeah and on top of like with the FDA they're very 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 uh not just organized but I mean Kendra is is my wife and she's uh, when there's a drug she can't even tell me anything about what's what's happening what's getting approved she she's literally like that and that's it's great you know but she cannot disclose any information at all i mean she can talk about like what's the fda and uh different drugs and you know what's uh you know she can describe all these other things of course but as far as a new drug being approved or disproved or anything she cannot disclose any information to anybody at all and she's very adamant about that very very adamant so i just you know it's none of my business so i don't I don't try to pry. Pamela, in terms of the side effects for, uh, for the, this new vaccine, uh, the FDA has not listed them yet. Yes, it's, it's, uh, it should be on there if they, have a, if they have approved it. It should be on there, and we'll get more information. The common side effects that there are being reported uh, were fatigue, muscle pain, headaches, joint stiffness, and joint pain. FDA noted a higher incident of atrial fibrillation, irregular heart rhythms among vaccine recipients relative to the control group. It is also identified as one of the uh, one, uh, one case of Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome, a rare uh, neurological disorder that damages the nerve cells and causes muscle weakness or paralysis. Uh, that was potentially related to the vaccine. I'm sure more stuff will come out about. Oh yeah, about there's it. you know there's pros and cons to everything yeah. you take. Even water. I mean, too much water. Yeah, too much drown water, you drown. You know? <laughs> uh, My drill sergeant said, there's no such thing as too much water. I said, what about a pool? He said, now nah, you're being silly. Give me 100. When he said that, give me 100. He's like, 100 push-ups. I'm like, man. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, so uh, to move on to our next topic, um, to or actually, I have uh, one uh one more, uh, just an idea, sure. really, that I thought of as we were discussing this. Of, It seems like there's been a lot more, and this might be one of the good things to come from COVID, um, is the awareness of uh, pulmonary diseases, whether that be COPD, COVID, RSV. It seems like there's a lot more attention being put there. There's a lot more attention being put there because uh, let's 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 look at the facts here. Um, ten years ago, just ten years ago, not talking about fifty years ago, just ten years ago, COPD uh, or lung disease. I should specifically state lung disease, but uh, uh, lung disease has been the most least funded disease ever. So there hasn't been a lot of studies done on it. When COVID happened, a lot of funding was happening how to help resolve this COVID crisis, this, this pandemic. Um, so more study was being put in and they're starting to find more things. Like they recently found out not that long ago, I mean, I'm talking about five years ago. Um, I, I wanna say it's a five or six years ago 
that they recently found out that not everybody who smoked got COPD. It was actually only 13%. So all, like, <clears throat> all these people that have smoked a, a two packs a day for 40 years thought they got COPD from smoking. And they were just misdiagnosed. And it was actually only 13% was a result of smoking. And the American Lung Association did this study. You know, they had this study and they actually have it on their website. 13%. You know, so they're starting to find out more and more about lung disease than we ever have because it wasn't such a big, to, uh, I guess to organizations, it wasn't such a big, to it wasn't such a big topic, you know. Um, like, let's take the AIDS, you know. Long time ago, there was this whole thing with AIDS happening and then now you barely ever hear about it. Yeah, that was a... Uh, like the, everyone the awareness says that was the 80s uh, yeah. virus awareness was just hyped up awareness dramatically where you know about AIDS you know pretty much everything about AIDS but you, you don't really hear about AIDS going around as much you know because the awareness now the awareness is here now you have people with lung disease and they don't, they're, they're thinking, oh, I got stupidity from smoking when they realized, oh, it was genetic. Oh, it wasn't lung disease. My doctor just put me like that because he, he found out I smoke, so he assumed I have COPD. We found a lot, large majority of people that went into the hospitals or saw the doctor or a doctor for the first time, they, they wrote it down that they have COPD because they smoke when they never did a pulmonary function test. And you'll see a lot of people like that. A lot of our patients like, are like that too. They're like, my doctor never did a, did a test. I said, what do you mean they never did a test? How did they diagnose you? They just wrote it down and said, I have COPD. Well, I forget who it was, but uh, a couple of weeks ago, we discussed uh, pulmonary function test, and I forget who, who it was said that they hadn't even received one. Yeah, they never received it. Yeah, we, on, we this, get, on this live stream, so. Yeah, and we, we get that. That happens so often. It's, 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 it's absurd, but it, it's, it, it's, 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 it's the world we live in, you know? Um, not saying the doctors are doing the wrong thing, but they need to really investigate to see what's the problem with that patient. Because if it's not a lung disease that's causing these lung problems, what is it? Was it hereditary? Is that, what can I do about it? What are the symptoms? What are the, what, like, what's my expectations? What's my prognosis? You know, um, yeah, it's just a lot of that is not now is more available, but before, not really. You know? So maybe this is a really good thing to come from COVID. In, in the long run. No. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. Especially with long-term COVID, people that have never had lung disease now have COVID. They developed long-term COVID. Uh, they have a lot of symptoms with that. It's not just RSV that's causing a lot of problems. RSV is just, they have a new vaccine, and uh, this was a hot topic uh, with RSV, so that's why we want to discuss RSV today. Yeah. But, um, you know, just lung disease, you know, no one has to live with a lung disease for the rest of their life. They can, uh, you know, do something about it. You can live a normal life just like anybody else would, you know, can. Uh, you don't have to just stay home being scared that you get a little windedness and you're thinking, oh, that's one of the symptoms my doctor said, that I'll be a little winded working out. But I don't know anybody who that doesn't happen to. They don't have to have lung disease for that to happen. But as soon as that doctor puts that label on your head, well, your symptoms are going to be increase in congestion, increased work of breathing. And let's just take those two. Increase in congestion, increase work of breathing. You go outside, you start walking, you start feeling a little heightening of work of breathing because you're working out. You're thinking it's not because of I'm weak, it's not because I'm out of shape, it's because of my lung disease. And your anxiety starts going up because every time you're, that work of breathing comes up and a little congestion comes up, it's starting to trigger your anxiety. So you're like, oh my goodness, now I can't go outside because I got a little bit of work of breathing. That's absurd. That's just that's silly, I should say. Put it easier, easier way. It's, uh, that's silly. Uh, you know, uh, athletes will get out of breath. I mean, I get out of breath. You know, I, I get out, out of breath. Yeah, and I mean, I'm 24. <laughs> yeah, it's it, yeah, it's you know, it, there is a such thing as being out of shape. You know, having anxiety uh, that can cause increased work of breathing, have a heart complication, completely nothing to do with lungs. And symptoms will include shortness of breath, you know. But we just have to understand what, how severe our shortness of breath is. So, so uh, just to move on to our next topic here. Yes. As we have a little bit more time. Okay. Um, you have a list in front of you on the back of on the back of that page. Uh, 
All right. List of things with, you should avoid with barbecuing. So Memorial Day is just around the corner. You have all of these uh, holidays coming up, like Fourth of July and everything like that. Uh, and inevitably, uh, there will be cookouts. Uh, I'm sure a majority of our audience will go to a cookout at do, least once. Do you ever see that movie, uh, Don't Look Up? Uh, no, I haven't seen that yet. Oh, my goodness. It is literally a great movie. It's, uh, 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 Dr. Neil deGrasse uh, was saying that it's, it's more of a documentary than a movie. And uh, <laughs> um, uh, uh, Meryl Streep uh, was uh, in, in the set. You know, it, it wasn't in real life. But um, she was, <laughs> she was the president. You know, she was the president of the movie, and she was smoking a cigarette, uh, and right behind, like she, it was right in front of a, um, uh, a big, huge uh, propane tank. It said it's flammable, no smoking. And she just got up, started smoking. She says, "Hey, where, where are the mature adults here? Okay." <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious. <laughs> you know, because I, I remember going to, uh, taking my kids out to see monster trucks, and there was this lady sitting in a wheelchair wearing oxygen, and she was just smoking like it was nothing. And I was like, oh, this, uh, you know, I was like, ma'am, you shouldn't. And she said, to me, mind your own business. And I was like, I said, you're about to blow up half the building. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no cares given. Yeah, just. No cares given. Just didn't care, you know, just not care, you know. So, uh, we right. have that list in front of you. I do, and I'll go over them. <laughs> All, right. All right, first one is smoke. Avoid being around. So, so rem remember what the topic is. List of things you should avoid at your summer barbecue if you have COPD or lung disease or even heart disease. Okay, smoke. Avoid being around smokers or sitting next to the grill as smoke can irritate your lungs and trigger COPD symptoms. Alcohol. First off, we also know that alcohol is a diuretic, and it's uh, not a very good thing, but, you know, moderation is, is very important. Drinking alcohol can make it harder to breathe as, uh, and, and can also interact negatively uh, with some COPD medications. Heat. Avoid overheating by staying in the shade or an air-conditioned area, as excessive heat can worsen COPD symptoms. <clears throat> it's almost a, a catalyst. Um, heavy or fatty foods. Large, heavy meals can make it harder to breathe and also can add, uh, lead to acid reflux, which can trigger CBD symptoms. Sugary drinks. Soft drinks and sweetened beverages can cause dehydration, which makes it harder to breathe. Eating spicy foods. Number six. Spicy foods. Spicy foods can irritate the airways and trigger cough fits which can exacerbate COPD symptoms. But let me talk, let me speak a little bit about this. Spicy foods. Um, there are a lot of benefits to spicy foods, but there are also, there's pros and cons to everything, like too much water, too much this, too much that. Um, but spicy foods, I eat spicy foods. And, but um, um, I do have to say that uh, spicy foods or even things with citrus fruits can uh, reduce Histaminal reactions, the IgE, immunoglobulin uh, support system, where you're, um, where you uh, prone to, let's say, ragweed, pollen, can actually help reduce it a little bit with spicy foods. But spicy foods can also obviously irritate the airways and call, cause uh, triggering cough fits, uh, which can also exacerbate COPD so, or so COPD a, symptoms. So it's a, an in excess. Yes, absolutely. Watch it in excess. It can help you, but it can also hurt you. Very much so. High sodiums. How much salt is too much salt when we per day? So two grams or less is good. 1.5 grams or less is better. And a gram of salt. Does anybody know how much a gram of salt is? Teaspoon. No. That, that's, uh, that is not much. For the whole day, not for per serving. What was the it? Don't they day. say if you eat one hot dog, that's enough salt for the whole year for your body? I don't know about that, but that's... Uh, that, that used to be the thing. Uh, really? That used to be the legend, yeah. That if you eat one hot dog, that's enough sodium for you for a whole year. <laughs> so high sodium salts uh, or salty foods can uh, cause fluid retention and make it harder to breathe. Uh, fried foods. Fried foods can be high in fat and cholesterol and also can cause acid reflux, which can also worsen... Uh, lung disease or COPD symptoms. 
Crowded areas. Avoid being in crowded. This is number nine. Uh, crowded areas. Avoid being in crowded areas or close proximity to people who may be sick, as respiratory infections can be particularly dangerous for people with COPD. It's always a good idea to let everybody that is coming over, or if you're coming over to going over to their house for a barbecue, just let everyone know to respect your boundaries. You know, just let everyone know, hey, I have COPD. I don't want to have an exacerbation. Can anybody, uh, can, you know, can you have a designated smoking area, you know, at one side of the house or backyard or something, you know, just to kind of be preventative. Uh, so crowded areas, um, uh, crowded areas, especially for respiratory infections, can be particularly dangerous, especially with people with lung disease or heart disease. Um, outdoor pollutants, be aware of outdoor pollutants such as mo uh, smog, pollen, or pollutants which can cause worsen COPD symptoms. Always consider wearing a mask or avoid outdoor activities on uh, high pollution days. Uh, a good idea is to go to uh, just, you can go to the uh, like weather.com or something and just look at the air quality that day. You know, if it's a high smog, if it's a high, you know, if there's a fire outside somewhere else, you know, that's causing a lot of problems, you might want to be inside. I know it's not the greatest thing you want to do, but it's just to this is just to keep you safe okay well I think that the, I think that's honestly really good to uh, keep in mind is yeah. all those things do you know what do you know which foods let me let me throw a curveball at this one let's see if anybody bring knows this which foods or how about let's name one food if eaten during the summertime can actually produces a like uh, basically like a sunscreen without you putting it on your own skin it naturally secretes to your skin, as that's what fluid usually does <laughs> during sweating. What food can actually act as a natural sunscreen if eaten uh, when you're outside in the summer heat? Is it a fruit, vegetable? Watermelon. Oh, really? That's why they're widely used during the summertime, watermelon. Yes, if eaten, watermelon can, uh, will actually produce a natural sunscreen. It's not like a SPF 50 or 100 or something. Uh, you know, but it, it, it will actually act as a sunscreen itself. Um, but they said you don't have to actually rub it on your skin. You just have to eat it. <laughs> Diane says we're making her really hungry because it's almost lunchtime. We're talking about barbecue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're almost there, Diane. You're almost there. Yeah. Uh, and then Rita says uh, she loves uh, having her chili when she's all stuffed up. Got to be careful, chili? though. Got to be careful, though. You can't, can't have it in excess. Yes, I know. There's always moderation. Always moderation. Just, just stay safe out there. Um, anyways, uh, that's it uh, for the time we have today. Does, if anybody has any comments, questions, uh, or next topics, please let us know. Please let us know. We'd love to have more. Uh, you can add them in the topics. comment section, or you can email us uh, at hrn. And, uh, it, yeah, and if you guys want us to go over a pulmonary function test, we can do that too. Uh, we did that a couple weeks ago, and uh, that was pretty good. I mean, yeah. I think that would be really good to do again. Yeah, absolutely. So, I yeah, mean, absolutely. It, it's little little things like that that make yeah, we can go over six-minute walk tests, lung stretches, whatever you want. So, you know, bronchial hygiene, the use of a nebulizer, you know, different applications for nebulizers. Uh, we can go over things like that. Weather and COPD. Yeah. I thought tomatoes helped as a sunscreen. Anna, I, uh, all I know is the watermelon uh, that was on top of my head is, is the one that I researched uh, a while ago. But I don't know about tomatoes. I don't want to give you a bad answer or a wrong answer. I would have to do research to find out. Now, did that say whether it had to be, like, watermelon on the rind or, like, watermelon chunks, or does it not matter? I don't think it matters. I think it's just, just watermelon. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll definitely be keeping that in mind as I go to the beach this summer. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Why, well, are so, why are you eating so much watermelon? I don't want to get sunburned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, everyone, thank you very much, and I'll see you next time.